excited for. We have Jerry Newman, who is the author of a blog called Reaction Wheel. Um, and what Jerry does is bring big data and artificial intelligence into the world of ad tech, finally. You know, I know it's all, we've all been waiting for this. But not to make our campaigns work better, actually to help us as the leaders and, and executives in this space to understand what's actually happening around what is the uh, lifeblood of ad tech, the money we all get from investors. So what Jerry has done, he's actually gone in and figured out where is investment money going uh, over time and why. And he's here today to share some fascinating new insights about the state of ad tech from an investor perspective. So Jerry Newman. Artificial intelligence. So a few months ago, Jonathan Mendez of Yieldbot asked me, what's going on with early stage venture capital investment in ad tech? And people ask me this sort of question because I, I think in the past 20 years, I've been involved in more ad tech or interactive advertising financings than, well, than almost anybody. So I, the last six years, I've been one of the most prolific early stage investors in ad tech. Before that, I, I co-founded an ad tech company and pitched 82 venture capitalists. Um, and before that, I, I ran venture capital for Omnicom Group back in the 90s. So people think I'm going to know the answers to these questions. But in this case, in fact, I didn't, and I had to go to the data. And the reason I didn't is because even though I'm one of the most prolific ad tech investors, I haven't invested, I haven't added a new ad tech company to my portfolio in two and a half years. So let's talk about the data. Let's talk about what it means to, to you, to me, to us. And then let me try to convince a few of you, at least, that you need to go back to the drawing board. So th there's these first two slides are charts. You don't need to actually read them. Um, but I think the main thing this showed, and this is I, I ran my uh, 600 ad tech companies against Crunchbase, and so what, what is, what's, how much money is going into this sector? Um, and you can see that 2013 is a partial year, um, so it's going to be bigger than that, although probably not a whole heck of a lot bigger. Uh, you can see that. The venture financing into ad tech is way down from 2011, which was the peak year. And I don't think, I don't know, maybe it surprises you, maybe it doesn't. It surprised me a little bit. And it surprised me because at the, the final moment when we are embraced by our interactive advertising brethren, we are part of the landscape, we don't have to explain what we do anymore, venture capital investment's going down. The thing that surprised me more was this one, and this is uh, foundings by year, right? So from Crunchbase, how many companies were founded in the ad tech industry by year? Now, you know, Crunchbase, you get what you pay for, right? Which is you watch a couple of ads. Um, so the data is not perfect. It's, it's biased. It's incomplete. It's wrong in some cases. But I think uh, and you can also you can argue with what I called ad tech and what I didn't, and people certainly have. Um, but I think the trend is pretty clear. There are a handful of ad tech companies that were founded this year, according to Crunchbase. So everybody I showed this chart to said, well, that, that's not right. I mean, obviously, I, I know there are more companies started this year in ad tech than this handful that Crunchbase shows. Um, and they couldn't name them. But they said, well, you know, it's, I think it's like, it's not New York. It's Silicon Valley. You know, and they're one of those, they're one of them, there are startup machines out there. Um, so I, I, all right. And I also had a hard time believing this. So I, I went to a different source of data. I went to AngelList, where founders put up their own companies. And in fact, on AngelList, I found scores of ad tech startups, more than 100. So on the one hand, you have AngelList with a ton of companies being started. On the other hand, you have Crunchbase with just a handful. And what's the, what's the difference between these data sources? And I think the, the answer is that, Ange, that AngelList is founders put up their own companies, right? So founders say, they look at the market and they say, hey, this is a big market. And I can start a company there. And I'm going to start a company. I'm going to put it up on AngelList and raise some money and, and, and get big. And it, it's an expression of entrepreneur optimism. On the right hand, you've got Crunchbase, which is biased towards major venture capitalist fundings, right? So these are the companies where some institutional venture capitalists had put money. I mean, even, even when I invest in an ad tech company, it doesn't always make Crunchbase. So this is, shows the difference between entrepreneur optimism and venture capitalist pessimism. So Brian didn't say, I also teach this course on innovation up at Columbia, so I'm going to go professorial on you. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is maybe a bit grandiose, but programmatic, I think, is a technological revolution. And then this is what innovation theorists call something that where a bunch of innovations come together and makes a, a big and lasting change to the landscape. Right? And they also spurs uh, a bunch of ancillary innovations around it. And 
you know, if you don't believe, and I, I know there are people in the world who don't believe that the programmatic revolution has been a revolution, that it's just some little thing. But when I, when I started working at Omnicom 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, the first thing somebody said when I went for the first day was like, oh, you're, you're the internet guy, right? You're the guy who's going to make this whole one-to-one -one marketing thing we've been talking about for 20 years happen. All right, so 40 years of one-to-one -one marketing. And then 10 years ago, The Economist had an article that said, the marketing department is the last piece of the modern corporation that has not been automated. That was 10 years ago. And now it's automated, right? We've automated it. And that's not going to change. That's, we're not going back to the old way of doing business. Uh, it's only going to keep getting more and more automated, more and more accountable. And that's when you see this kind of this curve that's beloved of entrepreneurs and venture capitalists both, the up and to the right curve. Right? This is uh, innovation coming in. The market gets built. Now you have all this innovation. People don't usually show you the second half of the curve, which is at some point it starts to level out. Right? And this is, why does it level out? Well, so Eric Franchi had this great blog post this last week, I think, where he said, if you're not selling into one of the existing buckets, you're going to have a really hard time getting people to buy what you're selling. Right? People need to know what bucket you're in so they can figure out whether they have budget for you or not. We have a lot of buckets. We have a lot of buckets. Right? This is if Terry Kawaja had been an abstract painter, this is what the Lumascape would have looked like. <laughs> And we're allowed a lot of buckets, right? Because there is so much innovation here. People say, all right, you know, there's so much innovation. There's this other little bucket. Let's try it. But we have definitely reached the point of saturation with our customers. They're not willing to create more buckets, right? They have enough buckets. They would prefer fewer buckets, in fact, um, which means that things level out. Now, this is kind of venture capital catch-22, right? It's, at the beginning, and this is when I was raising money for Root Markets, the company I started nine years ago. Um, this is what I heard, right? Well, God, there's no market, right? There's no market. So, you know, of course there's no market. We're trying to build a market, right? Um, and then a few years later, you start hearing, well, but it's too crowded. And this is actually, Michael Walrath, one of the founders of Right Media, said this a few years ago in an interview, I think in 2010. He said, I wouldn't invest in an ad tech startup because it's too easy to start one. It's too crowded. And then later on, you get, well, how will you compete with, you know, insert, generic big co here, this was a, a comment that somebody left on a blog post. It was a, a major venture capitalist left on a, a blog post I wrote just a few weeks ago. Well, how can you compete with Google? I said, well, I don't know. We're competing with Google, right? I mean, um, but it is, what, what this says is, it's sort of the, the catch-22 is you, you've got, the market's too small. The market's too small. Why are you so late to market? And, <laughs> I know this is annoying, right, to the entrepreneurs, but it makes a certain amount of sense, right? So there's people like me who are willing to take a ton of risk because there's a huge upside. And then there's people who are, are maybe a little more sane who are willing to take a, a certain amount of risk w without so much upside. But there's no venture capitalist who is willing to take a little bit of risk for a decent amount of upside, but not a ton, right? That's, those people don't exist in the venture capital market. It's not their job. And the fact that venture capitalists have walked away from this market says to me that this is where we are in innovation in ad tech. So what do you do? What are your options? This is Tom Paine, famous quote. Lead, follow, or get out your checkbooks. Right? You've got three options. Three options classically at this point in the innovation curve. Leading, obviously, means one thing in this market, right? IPO. So I switch these slides. Um, Top are the companies where if you Google, or sorry, use your favorite search engine to look for ad tech IPO, these are the companies that will come up in the various articles. The bottom ones are the ones where either their growth pattern or their funding pattern suggests that an IPO is really the only logical next step. And in some cases, that depends on what their venture capitalists thought at the time that they funded it, and I can't know that. Um, there are, in fact, companies who are not on this. I just heard one backstage that are, have filed to go public. And there are companies on this list who I know aren't going public. Um, but there's a lot of companies who could go public. And the public markets, so this, this top layer, I, just, I layered in the money raised through IPOs here on top of the first chart that you saw, the funding chart. If you layer in the money raised from IPOs to the funding chart, you see that ad tech funding really isn't that bad, right? I mean, it's actually pretty flat. And I expect it'll go up next year because of all those companies. So it's not that ad tech companies aren't getting funded, it's just that the public markets have become the, that little green slice investor. 
That was option one. Option two, what's option two? Option two is consolidation. We've been talking about this for, I don't know, four years. Right? These are the um, ad tech acquisitions by year. Uh, sorry, my, my right or left uh, axis went away somehow. Um, this, I think it was about 14 here in 2013. Uh, there was one yesterday, so maybe it's 15. Um, there is not some trend towards consolidation here, right? There's not a growing number of acquisitions every year. And, and in fact, consolidation is not inevitable. This is a, from the last wave of innovation, the ad network wave. These are, uh, I had a, a list of I think 600 ad networks with some of them had sizing, is rate reach basically, um, and I rank order them. And you can see that it falls off pretty rapidly. And the point isn't that the big get bigger, I guess that's the overall point, but not for this slide. The point is that there were hundreds of ad networks who were small, who are small. The, the consolidation did not happen in this space. Right? Consolidation is not inevitable. So that's option two. Option three, you get out your checkbook. You're seeing this now, actually. You've seen a few companies where the venture capitalists look and they say, all right, you know, this, is a, this is a great market. You see these billion dollar market caps. And we can find a team that is an awesome team that has built a big company before and taken it public. And yeah, they don't have a product. They actually haven't done anything yet. But let's write them a 30 40 $50 million check to get started. And, and I'm not going to name names right now. Um, but back in the 90s, after agency.com and Razorfish went public, you had venture capitalists walk in and say, hey, these companies have multi-billion dollar valuations. We can go get a, a, a great team out of, you know, name your top tier consulting firm, and we'll just put them together with a bunch of money and they can go build it. And companies like Scient and Viant and IXL and US Web to some extent were, were built this way that by somebody writing a huge check so they could outcompete people who are in that box already. I think that's, you know, it's an interesting strategy. Um, it didn't really last through the dot com bubble bursting. Those companies all disappeared. Um, but you'll, you'll see it again. You'll see people writing checks to try to compete. So those are the three options, right? And if you don't know that you have one of these options, you probably don't. If you're not one of the top three in your box, you're going to have a hard time. So what do you do if you're not one of the top three in, in your box? So there's a fourth option. And this is actually maybe most familiar to this crowd. Think about Right Media, right? At the end of the ad network phase of innovation, Right Media, which started out as an ad network, said, this isn't working for us. We are not competitive. So let's do something different. And the way innovation works, right? If the, if the leftmost S-curve is ad networks and the middle S-curve is programmatic, there is another S-curve coming, right? There are people out there right now who are doing something which probably looks kind of silly to you, right? It maybe looks like right media looked to most people in 2004. It's a toy, right? It's, it's full of crap inventory. But those people are going to slog away and build that market, and that market's going to grow. <coughs> And that's going to be the new wave of innovation. It's not people going out and doing something better, right? Because if you're doing something better in your bucket, if you're 10% better than the top three companies, nobody cares. You still can't get a meeting with the ad agencies, right? You need to do something different. If, you're, if you don't, one of those three options doesn't apply to you, you need to go out and do something different. And when I start seeing those different things, that's when I'm going to start investing in ad tech companies again. And I think if you're not one of the top three in your buckets, you should be thinking the same way I'm thinking. Thank you. Thank you.